title of my talk is about the Gladys models, but um, I will spend um, the first maybe 10 or 15 minutes talking about just Gladys models. So the, um, the Gladys models have been around for a while. They, um, they go back to 1930s, but they have been intensively studied since uh, 1960s. The most common example, I guess, is the six vertex model. Um, something happened to the subject recently, um, a new viewpoint, maybe. And so, um, the, uh, in one sentence, usually the vertex models were considered as equilibrium models. One fixes something at the boundary, and then something settles in between. So um, the new thing that happened is that they are being given a non-equilibrium perspective, which is one is able to draw configurations of vertex models in a Markovian way, starting from the boundary. So that Markovian or stochastic way of looking at them is something that I will talk about. Um, but first, I'll, uh, I will spend uh, a few minutes on the classical stuff, so to say. So, Usually, the uh, vertex model's origin is attributed to Linus Pauling. Uh, Linus Pauling was a remarkable person. Uh, if you, especially younger people in the audience, if you don't know who he is, I suggest that you should email, or you should not and also in other materials. So residual entropy is something that can be measured in real ice when the temperature approaches absolute zero. And it's a paradoxical thing. The entropy is supposed to go to zero, but if one measures it in different ways, then one gets non-zero. So where is it coming from? So his suggestion was to look at the uh, atomic static crystal structure of ice, which is roughly what's, oh, this is not very really Roughly, this is what it is. And so in the, strict, in the crystal structure of um, ice, there are oxygen atoms, which are red balls over there. And so each of them is connected to four neighbors. And each connection is what's called hydrogen bond. And on each hydrogen bond, there is a hydrogen atom that's closer, slightly closer to one end of that bond than to the other. And because of the uh, um, local electric neutrality, what should happen is that for each oxygen, there are two hydrogens that are closer to it and two hydrogens that are farther away from it. And uh, that creates exactly six possibilities for four edges to be occupied by closer atoms. Right? That, that's two, that, that's um, four choose two. Um, and so he asked him, he attributed the residual entropy to this freedom, to the freedom of, of putting the hydrogens on these bonds in such a way that <laughs> this rule is preserved. There are many possibilities that, that um, you know, to do that with a given array of, um, of atoms, but he just approximated everything by that number six. Of course, not all local configurations are compatible. Right, it will run into each other, but uh, well, he just ignored that. And so he got a number from that, which was within 10% um, of the experimental value. So I spoke to Edward Heath at some moment. He said that he considers this to be one of the most impressive applications of uh, physical thought. Anyway, so um, it's very, as I said, it's very difficult to compute the number of actual configurations. And uh, that's where the story started. The flat situation, so the, the square ice, so-called. So if you buy, if you put the uh, 
the picture of the square lattice, the question of computing the number of configurations remains, right? So now oxygens are sitting in, in the vertices of the square lattice. And so that got popular, popular in the late 50s, early 60s. Um, computing the number of configurations there is harder, but uh, was done by a repeat in 1967, it says. Um, asymptotically, so he computed the number of configurations asymptotically on the big doors, that was a success, and, and um, that started the whole domain, essentially. So um, what exactly was being computed? So that's uh, the pictures on the right, the big lattice, all the oxygens, H, and R, hydrogens that are close to those. I will not draw all of them H's, instead I will um, encode six possibilities by, um, by the vertices in the bottom row that have some of the edges darker and some of them lighter, with the bijection between one row and the other row. And why this particular combinatorial way of encoding um, is good, that's because if you have an admissible picture in the plane and you redraw it in terms of these vertices, what you see is a picture of heads that don't intersect but are allowed to touch. So essentially we are trying to count um, the, the number of heads in a domain uh, with some boundary. Formally, the six vertex model is a probability measure on all path configurations where the measure is computed like that. One looks at all vertices inside, and for each type of the six vertices, one has a weight. So that gives six different weights. So the model has six parameters. And one wants to know how the partition function behaves, for example, and the total sum of weights of all configurations. So how the typical configuration behaves. Um, six parameters is too much. There are several, if one fixes the boundary conditions in the domain, there are um, conservation laws. For example, the number of vertices is unchanged, so you can uh, multiply all, all weights by the same number, nothing is going to change. But then there are less trivial ones. The total of four, so one can actually remove um, four out of six parameters and, and, and leave two. Out of the two parameters remaining, um, actually one is responsible for <coughs> Um, properties of the model. Um, it's uh, people call it differently, an isotropic parameter, a conservation parameter. And then there is another one which is uh, known as the spectral parameter. And uh, changing that does not change the model much, and but the presence of it actually is responsible for the exact solubility of the model. I'll, I'll, I'll <coughs> the six vertex model can be was generalized in several directions. Um, these are three pictures that show three different directions. The picture on the left responds to a situation when uh, each word, each edge can be occupied by more than one path. And so if there are many paths traveling, and at each vertex you can have many paths entering and leaving, and so for any local configuration you can assign a weight, and then you get a model. This is, um, this is called the highest spin <coughs> vertex model. Um, and highest spin here is the terminology from uh, quantum mechanics, actually, the, uh, the lattice model. So I, I don't think um, chemists are interested in this anymore, but, but uh, physicists are. Um, quantum physicists actually are um, quite interested because these models are, are closely related to spin chains. Um, and um, their highest speed actually refers to the number of materials in the quantum particles. Um, then uh, the second picture here, it's related to the following. So one way which I will use a lot to encode um, <coughs> a vertex model or a path model is uh, the height function. So the height function when you cross um, an edge occupied by four paths, change it by four. So the blue here are the values of the height function model. And uh, as written, the, uh, the vertex doesn't only depends on the way the height function, function changes. It only depends on the gradient of it. <coughs> but one can also make um, the weight depend on the actual values of the height function, not just the gradient. So that, 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 that uh, brings, brings us to the whole class of models called solid and solid models. Um, and they are the 
And then finally, the third picture um, is uh, something um, that's quite interesting as well, and that's when the paths can be of different, I call them colors, but really of different species, so to say. They interact according to what color they are. And uh, again, any walk of exploration keeps me awake, and so we want to do something in these ways. So these will make the appearance, actually, the left and the right. As a picture, yes. As a weight, no. Right? And we don't just take the product. The weight of this vertex is not just going to be the product of the weights you get for all the colors. Right? So they interact. Okay, so this slide is um, a very ambitious one. It attempts to explain why people are able to analyze the six vertex model and do later more. And so the reason for their exact solvability is that somewhere in the model, there is a family of commuting matrices. And these commuting matrices can be diagonalized. They're called transfer matrices in this business. And um, the direct comparison to probability would be generated of a Markov chain. You know, Markov chain is generated, you can diagonalize it, you can say anything you want about the problem. There are Markov chains, there are not Markov chains yet, but they will be found. So the transfer matrix is, um, is depicted on, on, on this picture on the top, top uh, right. This is just the one layer of my model, and uh, I want to view it as a matrix with the matrix elements uh, labeled by the entering paths on the bottom and the exiting paths on top. And the value of the matrix element is the weight of what you observe on that flow. So that's a matrix. And uh, as I said, the, the weights of vertices, there are two parameters um, in the six vertex case. So one parameter I'll fix and never change. That's the quantization parameter. And the second parameter, the spectral parameter, I actually will change. And so I will think of this matrix as depending on that one parameter. The concrete representation of how this parameter enters into the weights. So here on the left are weights for the highest spin six vertex model. And so U stands for the spectral parameter and uh, um, Q stands for the quantization parameter. So um, the big statement is that these matrices for different values of U commute. And because of that, one can actually determine their spectrum and eigenfunctions and extract information out. And the reason why they commute, um, I couldn't resist but to put the picture on, on the board, it's a pictorial argument. The pictorial argument is based on the property of the weights of the six vertex model, the related models. That property is called the young box to equation, and it's, a, it's this picture here. This is a picture of three vertices drawn in a specific way, and the uh, um, two different ways on the left and on the right. And so this um, equation is, is saying the following, that if, if you fix the paths, how they enter and exit, and then you fill out the picture inside on the left and on the right, where the boundary condition here and here is the same, and you swap the two spectral parameters, the one you see here both at the top and here at the bottom. Then the left, what, the left picture and the right picture gives you the same thing. So the sum of the situation on the left is equal to the sum of the situation. This, is, this looks innocent. But this is anything but innocent. This is one of the deepest relations there is in mathematical physics. And I, I come to really emphasize the, the, the depth of the fact that there are non-trivial solutions Thousands of cases. Anyway, if you believe that this is true, then what you do is you want to prove that two of uh, matrices like that commute. So you put um, uh, one row on top of the other. That's multiplication in one order. And then we, we, do, we think we are on a torus. Right? So we put the whole thing on, on a torus. And then somewhere inside, we put a cross like that due to the matrix. And we put another cross next to it, which is the inverse matrix. We haven't done it with the matrix that we did. And then using the Young-Buxter relation, we take one cross 
and move it around, right? So it's the cross moving around like that. Once we move it around, we come back, matrix and its inverse cancel. But what we did on the way, we swap spectral parameters. This is called the zipper argument, and it's really the argument that explains the exact solubility of the data. Sorry. So which, which things are exactly solvable each other? Those that whose weights satisfy the unbox equation. Sometimes people specify and say that this is the unbox to solvability, but it implies some other notions of solvability. Okay, so the, the new ingredient, uh, I can say what the new ingredient now is. And so the new ingredient is this stochasticity property of our formula. And the property, the way I want to think about it, is that if I take weights of a vertex, and if I add them, so there are paths that enter and paths that exit. And if I add up these weights, overall possibilities of exiting paths, so they can exit in various ways, they give different weights, I want to add that up, and I want to get one. So that gives a probability distribution on all possibilities to exit. Right? Once you know how you enter, you know how you exit. Of course, a priori, um, <coughs> should anything satisfy that? So in the six verdict situation, what this really is giving you is that, um, well, there are six situations. These are the six situations. So if two paths enter, they have no choice. If none, there's no choice either. But then when one path enters, it has some probability of going straight and some probability of turning. And so if you could enter horizontally, this gives you one turning event. And if it enters vertical, that gives you another vertical. So there are two parameters. Then uh, in the color situation that I will, I, I hope to come to as well, um, the picture would be the same, except for now. So this is also a colored model, except for I just have two colors, empty and full. And so you might have more colors, but they will interact in the same way. If one color is stronger than the other, then that color will decide whether it wants to go straight or it wants to turn. Okay, this is also somewhat of an ambitious slide. It attempts to explain why to every vertex model one can associate a similarly solvable stochastic model, or a Markovian. So this is something that, that wasn't understood until very recently. But it turns out that if one starts with a with the young Buxter solvable model, so weights satisfying the Buxter equation. There is a way to conjugate those weights. So one takes a vertex and then multiplies it by something and divides it by something in such a way that the new vertex will satisfy the stochasticity condition. And it will also be a solution to the young box equation. So this holds quite generally. In particular, for the six vertex case, it will just produce what I, what I showed here. It will produce a stochastic six vertex like that. And uh, um, well, these slides were written for a longer talk, so forgive me, I'll, I'll skip the detailed explanation of what's going on. I just want to say that this uses nothing but the young box equation. All right, so then, what does one get? Yeah. with conjugation. So the conjugation here, so there is a conjugating line that enters here. There is a parameter that comes through that line. And then it and so generally speaking, if you conjugate the vertex model, you get a, 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 a SOS model. So there is an additional parameter that takes care of that thing. But when, in specific situations, one can kill that additional parameter, and then one gets back to the vertex. You do pay by the appearance of the new parameter that we get by the new Okay, so, um, so here is an example of a stochastic model. This is a stochastic uh, higher spin model. These are the exact weights, and you can check that these are these probabilities. They are up to one. There is a transfer matrix, which is now a Markovian operator. That operator, if I fix the number of paths that travel, 
that operator is explicitly diagonalizable. There is a, a family of uh, eigenfunctions written in here. Um, this, this formula is more for people who have seen symmetric functions before. This is uh, a not too complicated way to write a symmetric rational function. Um, these fun this is an algebraic basis. If we are on the full lattice, one needs uh, some Fourier theory, so one needs some orthogonality on this basis, but this can all be put in place. So there is an explicit orthogonality relation on, on these functions, and so the theory just behaves well. It becomes a Markov chain that, that can be done. So this is the inheritance of the diagonalization coming from the 30s and the 60s applied to a Markovian situation. Right? So there is an additional um, twist, which is not so let's see what it gives for the six vertex model. Again, for the six vertex model, this these are just paths that interact in this particular way. There are two Bernoulli frequencies that, that, um, that we exercise at every vertex. Um, this simulation is, uh, is uh, these paths when they enter uh, density on the bottom, and then they propagate according to these Bernoullis. This is the picture you get. So I don't want to describe this picture in terms of the height function. So the height function, again, it changes by one when I cross one pair. It's just easier to talk in terms of the random function. So this picture can be completely understood. And, uh, and so the completeness, what I, what I mean by complete understanding is that there is a limiting behavior for the height function, the limit shape for this plot, and the limiting theorem for the fluctuations of the height. In this particular case, the limit shape is uh, explicit. It's an elementary function, actually. And the fluctuations are um, of size L to the one third, where L is the linear size, linear scale of the picture. And they belong to the, to the KPC or the cell. So just to understand the picture here, time goes in that direction. And there is no, so formally, there is no time. There's, there's a two-dimensional time. It starts from the boundary of the quadrant. You, you can propagate in any direction you want, as long as you go inside the point. If you want, if you bend it one time, you want to put it on the diagonal and then you do the update like that. But you can also update you can also update yeah, yeah. This is essential, it will be essential in a second. There is no dedicated time direction. There is a different one. Okay, so um, just to put things in, in a little bit of a perspective. So why would, should I should I care about these models? They've been studied for 60 years or more. Um, well, it turns out that not only Markovian situation is sort of easier to try to understand, but it's also easier to prove something. So this result, the limit shape and the fluctuations, this is the first result proven for the six vertex model for both limit shape and fluctuations. Despite that, that one, I mean, okay, people have conjectures, but there are no tools to get there. Once you get the Markovian structure, it becomes easier. Okay, so it also gives information back about the original, the original equilibrium. Right. So I understand this is much more dedicated, but if one is less ambitious and wants to go back to the 67 result, but the condition of the entropy in this particular case, is that easy or obvious? So, um, yeah, as, as, as an example. So, uh, a follow-up result in this situation, which uh, is not on the slide, is the understanding of the translation invariant Gibbs measures that happen in the bulk of this picture. Right. So this is due to, to a model of their own. Um, it was also quoted yesterday for a different reason by HT. This is to say that we to prove the universality with the optimal amount of moments, uh, the optimal number of moments for the linear matrix of the two process. But anyway. So um, there is a one prominent family of, of the delivery of um, translation layer and Gibbs measures that arise over there. And one gets the phi energy for that. It's not the whole set of uh, translation layer and measures for the, for the six vertex model. For those that you get from here, you get the information. Back. This really sort of singles out a piece of the theory that's more manageable. Story. It's a long story, it's a beautiful one, I guess, uh, but uh, I don't want to talk more about it, and I don't want to talk about it anymore. 
I want to talk about um, some other stories that are less um, talked about, more unusual. So first, maybe a, a common. So this um, stochastic six vertex model has two degenerations that are easy to state and that people might have seen before. One is ACEP, the asymmetric simple exclusion problem. So if I tune my Bernoulli frequencies in such a way that my PS like to turn all the time, then the picture after looks like this. The PS go diagonally. And then from time to time, there is a defect, so they go a little up, or they go move to the right. So then what it means is that if you go into the moving coordinate system, you're looking at particles that jump left and right independently, and they and there is an exclusion for constraint. They can't jump on top of each other. So that's exactly right. So this is the system of particles. And then also somewhat more involved limiting transition will produce the um, the KPD equation or not the KPD equation, one plus one dimension. So they can have and try to stay away from the KPD. Here is a different limit of the stochastic six vertex model that uh, was unusual to me, and I, I'll try to say that. So the ASIP limit was related to the limit when paths liked to turn all the time. Now I want to take the different limit when the paths don't want to turn. They want to go straight, and then at some moment they decide to turn, so they turn, and then again go straight for a while, and then they turn. So this is a, um, a trajectory for <coughs> persistent random walk. So what happens if I take this limit in my stochastic six vertex form? So here is the result. What happens is that there is again a limit shape for the height function. That limit shape is a function of two variables, of course. And so that function of two variables satisfies this equation here. This is a second order partial differential equation. It's linear. It's a wave equation with a lower order term. So, um, what is this equation? My disappointment, I couldn't find any meaningful information about it in any modern textbook on PDEs. I had to go to the book which is 100 years old, the book by, uh, by Florence and Hilbert, where I did find a chapter about it. Um, and I only went there because my father told me. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very enjoyable read. It tells, it tells one how to solve such equations. There's nothing more, you know, nothing better. This equation, as I said, is not popular among mathematicians, but it is popular among physicists and biologists. So one example is the following. If they look in the microscope into many types of bacteria, for example, E. coli, and they look how the bacteria moves, apparently it moves according to something called run and tumble. If you Google run and tumble, you'll see movies. You know, they have uh, something called uh, Flagellum, which is like a tail, and so it rotates, and the bacteria moves straight. And at some moment, something changes, and then it tumbles, and then again it moves straight, and then off it goes. So this is a path of like bacteria like that living in one dimension. So it goes left, tumbles, and then goes straight. Anyway, so um, a little more seriously, what happens is that we get a hyperbolic equation to describe the limit shape. I have not seen that before. Typically, limit shapes are described by elliptic equations. This is an equilibrium uh, problem that one gets in hyperbolic form. What about the fluctuations? So it turns out that the fluctuations are described by the same equation with the noise. So instead of looking at the, at the uh, um, homogeneous equation, I just put white noise with some amplitude that depends on limit shape. That gives me a, a differential equation with noise. The result is a uh, random field, and that is the fluctuation field for the noise. So such equations have appeared uh, in the literature before, but usually, uh, I mean, actually exclusively, from what I can see, um, in order to state that you can do that, that the solutions are well defined, this is a, a nice problem, and no inquiry will happen. I only see these appearing from a sort of meaningful model. It's something that one might care about discrete models. It's, it's, there's a reason why this is interesting. Of course, this is simpler than the six-vertex model. It's a Gaussian process. 
but one can see some structural features of it that are not visible from the six vertex model. And then you try to go back to the six vertex model and ask yourself whether this is true, and sometimes it's true. And you can guess features of the six vertex model from here. And then you take a different degeneration, and so this would really predict some features of ACE, which is uh, pretty something to it. I couldn't resist, so um, right, I, actually, I didn't say something. Over here, you see it says hyperbolic heat conduction equation. So this equation here, one of the names that it's given in the literature is, is telegraph equation, because it describes current of telegraph, the actual telegraph. Uh, hyperbolic heat conduction is because this equation in physics is something that is used as a more realistic way to describe the heat flow because here the, the propagation velocity for the heat is finite, not infinite as in, in the heat equation. And so, but anyway, so I couldn't resist that this is a purely sort of slide that could have been in the after the course and, and it wasn't, except it wasn't. Um, this is the Feynman-Katz formula for the telegraph equation. Right? So that for the heat equation, Feynman-Katz tells you that if you want to solve the heat equation, you need to run um, Brownian motion, right, backwards. And then if it's a, a homogeneous equation, then you just read off the value of the initial condition at the, at the point where you land. And if it's inhomogeneous, you also need to re record whatever you collect in the way. Right? Noise or whatever inhomogeneity is. So in this case, the Brownian motion is uh, being replaced by the trajectories of um, or the persistent random walk. That's not surprising. Um, except for now, you can shoot these trajectories from your observation point in two different directions, right? left and right. And this actually matters. And then there is how do you get, take into account the inhomogeneity? The way to take it into account the inhomogeneity is that instead of integrating along one path, there are two paths. You have to take the area between two paths to the side and integrate that against the intermediate. Now this, um, th th this is the final cast for this for the telegraph thing and I like it aesthetically so that's the reason I thought this. But it, here you don't care if that one is equal to the two. No, I mean in this case this, this is another one because you can rescale one of the axes and they will be equal. Yeah, so this level is equal. Whereas for the other one you look out the fluctuation the whole system is really complicated. Yeah, no, no, no. So beta one and beta two are, are indeed, they, they, they came from the two. Well, um, I mean, if they're equal, then the still exists. You have, you have to change the formulation. I mean, this theory here is in terms of the sort of, the, the something that's reminiscent of the whole Hopkins form, right? And then you have P equal to beta one like beta two to high function. So if beta one is equal to beta two, then you just get this height function here directly without the initial cold. But it's a similar type of thing. You get a limit here, just you don't need to do the exponential change. Okay, so I do have a little bit of time, so I'll allow myself to just to keep going here. Um, one more thing. One more usual sort of piece of so uh, I, I'd like to say a few words about the colored model. So the colored model, again, comparing to the uncolored six vertex, uncolored you just have paths that go you know, up and to the right, and then decide independently of where they go. And now you have paths of different colors, let's say five different colors, and the colors are ordered. You have stronger paths and weaker paths, and I have them all uh, linearly ordered. And so if you're um, Restricted paths only with color starting from something, you just you get a color blind model. So there's no distinction. You just have a color hole, so with weak as strong. Or you can stratify the colors into whatever whatever number of classes you want. Stronger ones and weaker ones. But in general, you can just have many colors, all linearly ordered, so-called rainbow sectors, that's the one. And so this is the simulation. Then you have colors in the rainbow sector of Entering paths of different colors entering through the left side of the, <coughs> of the quadrant of every row. And then they propagate again using the balloon. This is what I just talked about, the six third, the, the stochastic six third. And it's just this one when you forget the color. 
And then how I can't resist but to say that, 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 well, when you look at this, and just compare it to that, it's very hard to convince yourself to study this picture, not this picture. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let me formulate a result. And we'll formulate the result about the colored model. Again, I have a colored model, and I have colors that enter at every row, and the strength is increasing, so the strongest one is up. And I will compare this model with the colored line model. So color blind is the one we so The result says the following. Let me take some rectangle here, and let me look at the set of colors that exit on the left. It's a random subset of numbers of one to n. If we look at the colorblind model and look at positions where the paths exit from the right. This is a random subset of all the way. The statement is that these two sets are to distributed. I don't know why this is true, but this is true. This is the model about which, which we, are, we know something. Limits, KPZ, telegraph equation, whatever. This is a much deeper object. But somehow, if you want to study the spread of the colors, you've got to study position. Here is, a, here is a formulation of the same thing for tacit. Maybe tacit is easier to, to think about. But let's think about tacit or acid. So particles start at positions minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, and so on. And then they have colors. So the first one is the weakest one. That's what in tacit theory and tacit theory is called second class particles. Right? The particle that just it tries to move, but then if somebody move, wants to move over it, it has to yield, they swap. And then the second one is a little stronger, and the third one is a little stronger, and so on. And they start off, and off they go. And you want to know what happens at large time. If you forget about the color distinction, that's just, that's just usual acid. But now, there's more information. So the theorem that I stated at the previous slide reads the following. That if you want to know the whether there is a specific set of colors to the right of some, to, to the right of some position on the left, you've got to look at the color blind picture and see if some positions are occupied to the right of them. Still not clear intuitively what it should mean, so let me do, let me apply this to one part. So here. Now it should be very transparent. I just have passive starting of, of half lettuce, with the first particle being weak. This is the first, this is the second class particle. One of the theorem says. Well, it says the following, that if I'm at some location, and I want to know whether the second class particle is to the right or to the left, the equivalent to what I'm trying to determine is whether the position right next to me is occupied or not. So before, before saying what that gives you, let me try to give you a real life analogy, right? So this is a big queue of whatever, people, runners, whatever. And, uh, in front of the queue, there is a pushover, right? There is a person who, you know, the person likes to run, but whoever wants to, run, to overtake that person overtakes that person. Where will that person end up in large time? If there is a chance that that person will run away, be the first one. And there is also the chance that that person will get swamped, right? I mean, it's what you what happens on average? So that's the question we are trying to determine, right? At large time, we are at some location on the line, and we are trying to determine whether that pushover is to the right from us or to the left. The theorem tells me that that's the same as the probability of having the location they are occupied, or the density of uh, tacit at large time. The density of tacit for large time is very well known. That's actually linear in this situation. It, it, uh, it uh, decreases from 1 to, um, to 0. And so that, what that tells me about the pushover is that the distribution of that pushover over all possible positions it can take is uniform. 
is equally likely to be the first one, as he at the very bottom of where he could have, he could have potentially been. If we go back to the simulation picture, see what happens here is that these colored lines are all, you know, they all seem to be straight lines. So the pushovers are the very blue guys. Right? They're, they're somewhere here. So where do they end up? So the statement is that if you take the column where they could have ended up, the spread over here is basically you. The fact that these are straight lines is not, uh, for the six vertex is not proven, actually. It should be true. But for Tassif, it actually was true. So the theorem that I told you uh, about the pushover, Tassif and the first particle, that's actually known. That has been known for a while. This is due to the theory of Kipnis back in the 1990s. But remember, this is an application of what I stated. One color in one part. And the next level of application would be, you have two pushovers starting here and here. What is the chance that they, and then after a large time, you're standing somewhere and you're asking, what is the chance that they're both to the right of you? Turns out, they are asymptotically independent from this. The claim that one is to the right, is independent from the thing that the other one to the Which is strange, you know, the two friends, they start over from the same position, you go at large times, and there you go. If they're being weak, they're just weak. No. Anyway, I think it's hard to explore actually higher levels of uh, uh, okay. I got you away. I'll just I'll just finish. Um, so what, what I wanted to say is that there, there seems to be a new flavor in, in the old subject of uh, the uh, lattice models. And the flavor is that instead of looking at them in an equilibrium way that you fix the boundary, you decide what happens on the inside, you model them by, by, by having a Markovian process off the boundary. That, on, on one hand, that falls into the same sort of nice logic brain setup. On the other hand, it seems to be easier and produces some phenomena probabilistically that I haven't seen before and that, that I think are unusual, like uh, the paragraph equation, like this um, colored, uncolored reality statement. There are, there are deeper reality statements there that I, I haven't seen them before so far. And um, I'll just see where it goes next. Thank you very much. They are double of one tech algebra, and people study them that quite a bit. So, this, this makes the connection to, to, to that theory. And um, one can prove they are orthogonal again, they form a nice Fourier basis. One thing I cannot do so far is that I do not have an application of their Fourier theory to a probabilistic question. Right? I mean, really, the, the statement that I was making here about the pushover being uniformly distributed. That's a consequence of this um, strangely looking matching statement between a colored model and a 
And so any asymptotic statement I can make so far about the colored model comes from some sort of a match into the uncolored model, which I understand is better. But ideally, one should take these eigenfunctions and then do the Fourier theory. And then get some sort of weight function. What's the weight function that they were talking about? It's just impossible to say. No, it's not, it's not impossible. It's, um, so here, the weight function is some sort of a, of a product of uh, pairwise differences or pairwise differences with the Q. Right, so UA minus UV over UA minus QUV. The same type of weight functions will appear there as well. Except for here, the functions are symmetric, and those will be non-symmetric. Well, I mean, they're just going to be uh, arbitrary polynomials and variables. Those symmetrizations will be these functions. But the weight function, I mean, the, the, the weight of the inner product will be the so this. And the algorithm, how Mandela liked to look at them, is that he started with monomials, and then he also analyzed with respect to the product. So this would be. Similar, but I should say right away, I have three, four <laughs> different proofs of this statement here, and I still do not understand it. I, I do not understand where it is coming from. Right? In projections like the one product of the <coughs> one color, you can come up with simpler arguments saying that this is how it works. The full power. It, it, it says that the distributions of subsets, one to n, where n is arbitrary, is the same in one situation and the other situation. I'm trying to, 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 to play around, yes. I want to understand the nature of, of, of these things. I mean, they are powerful. They do tell you what the asymptotics of the colored model is, if you believe you know what the uncolored is doing. But the order, I mean, there has to be some structural reason why this is happening, and this is what we're 